Margo, good to be here and good to see so many faces of familiar people that I haven't seen in a long time. It's wonderful. Um, thank you for the privilege of being here to share your pulpit. Uh, it's certainly a great honor for me to be here. And, you know, as Ken and Mandy, uh, Ken said, Ken and Mandy uh, and us go back along with my wife would have loved to have been here. But she couldn't because it's a five-week month and we're pretty thin on the ground. And so she's leading worship at our church. Um, and that's why she couldn't be here. But she does send her love and her greetings. Um, so much I want to say. And I, I hope I'm going to be able to get through it all. I hope you packed your lunch because we could be here for a while. <laughs> but before we jump into this morning's passage, I just really felt to encourage you guys as a church. As I was sitting there worshiping. And saying, Lord, what do you want me to say to, to this amazing group of people? Just to encourage them. The picture that came into my mind is of this uh, uh, lush, fertile valley with multiple streams of water. And it was all coming together and forming into this giant river that just grew in intensity and strength and momentum. And that's what I really felt God was wanting to say to you that, and as I look around here, there's this diverse, rich community of people that have gathered here in Christ that have come from all different backgrounds, maybe all different churches, all different journeys and stories. And in God's sovereign grace, He's brought you into this community for this moment in time. And it's not just to be a consumer, not just to be a passive, you know, uh, attender, but to actually bring the richness of your life story up until this point and to form it into what God's doing here so that it can carry a sense of this momentum and energy and power into this new season as you move forward as a church. And so I really trust that that is the sense that you have that, you know, God is doing something in this moment in this church uh, to be a blessing to this community. And it is the involvement and contribution and participation of every individual here and the unique power that you bring as you form it into the body of Christ. Um, it's kind of Ephesians, really. Um, that's what Paul's been saying. And Paul, I'm, I trust you've been hearing Paul saying in this passage. So let me pray and we'll just jump into this passage. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's living and active and it speaks to us today. Even though it was written, uh, Lord, by different people to different hearers, Lord, it has, it has something so powerful and vital to say to us today. And so I pray you'll help me communicate it faithfully. Help us to hear what your spirit is saying in the text to us today. Lord, I pray that you will find in us open ears and willing hearts, not just to be hearers, but doers of your word. And so to that end, Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit here now. We still our hearts in your presence and we pray, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus and reveal yourself in your word. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians, um, one of my favorite books in the Bible. And if you've been reading through it, you can see why that might be the case. It is a great book. So my brief this morning is to tackle, as we said, whatever the heck I want from Ephesians 5 or 6. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do uh, my best to cover as much as I can uh, in this passage. And so I've entitled my message, um, House Rules, this morning. If you're taking notes, House Rules. And um, a bit about myself, um, I'm, I'm married to um, Dash. As you heard this morning, we've got two adult kids. My son, Micah, is 22, turning... No, 23, actually, just about to, in the end of May, turns 23. My daughter, Ebony, uh, is turning 22 this year, um, both university working part-time. And one of our favorite things to do is play Monopoly. <laughs> play Monopoly. And now, again, the, just the mention of that word might provoke all kinds of responses and reactions for you. Either, and I'm seeing already people going, Jesus, I rebuke that thought. Uh, <laughs> And others are going, yeah, there's, there's fond memories around, you know, time spent playing Monopoly. But for more often than not, for most people, it's, it's kind of a, a trigger, you know, kind of remember like four or five hour games that just drag on and drag on intense competition, you know, people saying and doing all kinds of things, not trading that one property that you needed to, you know, complete your, all of that. The reason I mention that is that there's a thing around Monopoly that you don't often find with a lot of other board games, and it's called House Rules, where every family comes up 
with all kinds of weird rules. Like who has ever played the rule? If you land on free parking, you, you, you have to put, you know, you get all the money that's in the middle. Yeah. It's not in the rules. <laughs> or, you know, if you run out of money, you can go to the bank and borrow money. Who, who does that? Yeah? They're, they're house rules. And you know what happens? It drags on the game. And people end up hating it. Because it's not how it's meant to be played. And so one of the things that we, we came up with as a family, we, we read the rule book like over and over again to really understand who, the people who made this game, we're a bit nerdy like that. You know, Ken will tell you about me reading manuals in the early days of mobile phones so I could teach him how to use his own phone. Um, I was just not, you know, the theology guy. I was the mobile phone guy too. But the point was that it created a sense of frustration around a very great and fun game because people just invented their own stuff of how they were supposed to do this. We've come to a section in Ephesians called the Household Code, which is really Paul's rule book, if you want to use that expression, on how to do relationships well. The problem is we all have house rules around these relationships, around how to do marriage, around how to parent kids, around how we should conduct ourselves in the workplace. And what happens is that we lose sight of the rule book of the person who actually created all of these relationships and gave us instructions on how we're to live and what tends to happen is we end up being frustrated in our relationships because they're not working as we think they ought to it's because we're playing by our own rules and so this morning i want us to come back to the rule book and go let's re-examine what Paul has to say here and re-examine maybe our own house rules that we've adopted that we need to critique and correct and bring into line with God's Word. And maybe, just maybe, we'll actually find this messy, difficult, painful, hard thing called relationships working a little bit better because we're actually understanding how they're supposed to work. But just a couple of things I want to say straight up the front. This is a hard passage, right? This is probably one of the most controversial... Thanks, Ree. Uh, one of the most controversial... <laughs> passages in the New Testament. A lot of ink has been spilled over this, you know, these passages here. So the bad news is I'm not going to answer any of those questions for you today. I'm not going to resolve any of those things because they're big, big debates. What I'm going to hopefully try and do is take a step back in the context of the therefore series that you guys are looking at, which is really Paul saying Jesus has done something amazing that is life transformative. And how should that reality of the gospel change everything for us as Christians? That's a great lens to take as we look into this passage. Because if we lose sight of that and get bogged down into the details, we lose the, the forest, the beauty of the forest for the trees. Because we're just so close. We're trying to figure out how we're supposed to do marriage. What does submission look like? And all of that stuff. And we kind of lose the wonder of what Paul is actually trying to tell these Christians about how to live their lives. So I'm going to try and do that. The other thing that we need to say up front is that it's really hard to come to this passage without our biases. Because being completely frank and honest, this passage has probably been used and abused by many, many people, even within the church, to oppress women, to oppress children, to, to teach wrong things, to instill power in those who wanted it. And, and because of that, we might have been the victims of it. We might have heard things that have really wounded us and hurt us, made us feel devalued, made us feel less than who God created, and all of those things. And so we read this and we go, man, it's like Monopoly. I don't even want to go here because it triggers so many bad memories and hurt and, and stuff that I just can't even... And I've, I've actually talked to some people who, who skip this part when they come to Ephesians because it, it, it represents that much hurt for them. So we need to be honest with that. We need to acknowledge that when we come to this, it's really hard for us to come to it and hear what Paul is saying to the Ephesians and see what he's trying to say to them in an unbiased way. So at least let's acknowledge our biases and go, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to come to this passage because of my baggage and history. At least that's something that will help us. And that's all my introduction. That's 10 minutes gone. Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room before we actually get to the text. Submission. Submission. And I was told I can get some interaction. What thoughts, feelings, ideas does that word, like monopoly, trigger for you? Submission. Tell me. Just 
a few thoughts, Margot. I know you've got lots. <laughs> you know, I, I'm preaching today, but please, shh, just a couple of thoughts. Oppression. Oppression. Yep. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Great, great. Obedience. Pardon. Obedience. Obedience. Yes. To conform, yep. Control. Control, yeah, that's a great word. Respect. 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 Abuse. Abuse. Submit. Familiar faces in the back there. Submit. Submit, yep, that's what we're talking about. Submission. Any other thoughts? Okay, cool. A couple of things that I want to say up the bat that we need to understand about this word because it's the thing. Like we start in chapter 5, verses 21. That's where we're kind of jumping in. Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on to talk about husbands and wives, children and parents, uh, slaves and masters. But that's the kind of critical verse, the, the operative verse that sets up everything else, submit to one another. And if we don't get our head past all of our objections around that word, we'll never actually hear what Paul's actually trying to say here. Okay, so submission. Uh, firstly, we need to say that in, in, the, in the Greek, in the Greco-Roman time, this word was used within particular structures of authority. We can't escape that. That's how the word was used in its period. It, it, it carried the idea of structure and existing power structures, if you want to use that word, or authority or responsibilities. Or, uh, it, was, it was not in a vacuum. It, it, the word was used within certain shaped relationships. A good example of that is Romans chapter 13, where Paul is calling the Romans to submit to the governing authorities because he says that all of those authorities have been established by God. Or 1 Peter chapter 2 is another example where Peter says to those Christians, submit to the emperor, submit to the ruler because they're there by God's authority. Or in Hebrews chapter 13, where the writer there is instructing Christians to submit to their church leaders for the same reason. Authority structures that God has instituted. So we need to say that. The second thing we need to say is that overwhelmingly in the New Testament, submission is not a dirty word. It is for us. And we need to acknowledge that. But we need to acknowledge that maybe that's our cultural bias. It's not a biblical teaching. So, for instance, you know, like I've given you some examples, if you're going to put those up on the screen. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. But Jesus' whole life and ministry was characterized by this word submission. Jesus often said, you know, I'm not here to do my own thing. I'm here to submit to the Father's will. The best example of that, two profound ones. One is when he gets down. He's the most powerful person in the universe, right? Let's just keep that in mind. And he gets down and washes his disciples' feet. That's submission. Yeah. Or when in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, but yours be done. Submission. Even his whole experience of becoming human, Paul in Philippians 2, frames in the language and the context of submission. He humbled himself. He, he became human. He denied his privileges and his authority and his power in one sense as the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, and became human. All of Jesus' life and mission is characterized with the idea of submission. And his ultimate display of that is dying on the cross. But then Jesus tells us that we are, ought to be characterized by submission too. And in that passage in Mark chapter 10, when Jesus talks about the Son did not come to be served, but to serve. And he says, you go be like that. Don't exercise your authority in an unhelpful way like the pagans do to oppress and dominate and subjugate other people. Instead, be like me and be a servant leader. Submission. Paul, everywhere, and Ephesians 4 is just one example, and Peter, to call on Christians to embrace this value and this idea of submission in their relationships to each other. So how should we define this? Well, a, a really helpful definition is yielding to someone in love. That's, that's probably a good definition. It's what you do every time, well, I should say, what you should do every time you come to a giveaway sign. All right. You're not sitting there going, hang on a second. Whoa, whoa. No, you just go, I yield. In America, giveaway signs are called yield signs. And I think that's a really cool definition of submission, where you yield to somebody else. All right, so quickly, some things that then submission is not. 
Okay, submission is not a devaluing of other people. It's not about a, a way to, to oppress and marginalize other people. Absolutely not. Um, submission is not being a doormat and having people walk all over you and, and just treat you as a piece of rubbish. No, that's not biblical submission. It may have been corrupted and, and used that way, but it's certainly not how the Bible talks about it. Submission is not losing your voice. It's not, ha not having a say. And in some cultures, maybe even in some churches, that's how it's presented. That if you're going to submit to me, then you don't get a voice. You don't, I don't, I don't want to hear an alternate view from you. That's not biblical submission. It's to have your voice and have your opinion. It's actually, one, one writer said, that it's only when I have a disagreement of opinion that submission actually comes into play. It's what do I do at that point? It's not not having a voice. It's how do I yield to somebody else in love when I do have a different voice. And then the last one is it's certainly not tolerating abuse and violence and oppression and bullying. It's, it's not, yeah, you just need to take it because you're supposed to be submissive. You're just supposed to cop it on the chin and just keep loving and just keep putting up and tolerating with abuse and toxic behavior. Not at all. There's nothing in the Bible's idea of submission that carries that. I want to say all of those things up front. And that's just all the background stuff. A few more things I want to say in terms of introducing this passage. Number one, it's purpose. When we come to Ephesians, we really need to appreciate the, the context that Paul is writing in. And like I said, this is the household code part. It began really the section in chapter 4, verse 1. Paul, in the first three chapters, and you would have covered this, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, has expounded the gospel and its implications for us theologically. And how in, in Christ, something radical has taken place of coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then from chapter 4 onwards, he's now spelling out the practical implications of that. And in the first section in chapter 4, he's talking about how that gospel truth, the transforming work of God's grace in our heart, ought to affect church life. And then he goes on to talk about how that should affect our ethical life, our moral living as Christian people. And then now he talks about how that truth should affect relationships that were central in, in the New Testament era. Because it wasn't just Christians who had household codes. Everybody had household codes. Because the rationale in the Greco-Roman world is if you have a strong family, you have a strong society. And if you have a strong society, you have a strong empire. So Aristotle and other Greek philosophers, uh, other Roman philosophers and writers had household codes. So this is not unique to Christianity. What is unique is what Paul does with the household codes. He subverts the social norms of his day. So we need to keep that big picture in mind, the historic context. Then we need to recognize that there are some really cool things that Paul is doing here that shows his priorities. A couple of observations. One, women... Children and slaves in Greco-Roman society in the first century were nobodies. We need to keep that in mind. They had no voice, no power, no rights, no say. They were nobodies. And the very fact that Paul addresses them at all is a radical, radical shift. Huge that he actually speaks directly to wives in his church. That he speaks to children. Nobody did that. That he speaks to slaves. He's giving them dignity and value in the body of Christ. He's not undervaluing them. He's actually elevating them. And the fact that he's talking about those in power and calling them to act in different ways was also a radical, radical shift. So his priority, we, historical context, the, the, his priority is to talk to the marginalized and the oppressed. The, the third thing we need to keep in mind is the, the historic context. The, the problem we have is that we read our context back into Ephesians. But you know, I was doing some of this teaching in Kenya, and I've done some of it in Sri Lanka, and they're still here. When I go and talk to them about wives submitting to their husbands, they go, yeah, whatever. Tell us something we don't know. But when I talk to them about husbands, love your wives, they go, what? Are you serious? But see, we don't get that. Because we're reading our Western cultural bias into this passage. But we need to keep in mind that Paul's not talking to us directly. He is talking to a bunch of people who are living in a very, very different culture and context than we are. The last thing I want to say, and I'm nearly finished my time, so 
We'll never get to the passage. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is that we need to keep in mind that Paul's purpose here is not to give us a detailed dossier of how to do marriage in the 22nd century. Is that what we're living in, 22nd century? That's not what his intention is. His purpose here is to do exactly what you're doing in this series, is to step back and go, the Christ event, the cross, the gospel, has radically changed the human experience. In Christ, we've become new people. And if we're new people, then we need to live in different ways. And that difference has to affect everything, including how we treat each other. In the church, in our homes, in our workplace, that's what he's trying to do here. So at the end of this sermon, are you going to have any more insight as to how to treat your husband, how to treat your wife, how to treat your kids, how to treat your parents? I hope so. But it's because of the work you would have done, not because I can spell out to you from what Paul is saying how you should do that. So with that all in mind, let's actually jump in to our passage. And I'm not going to read this because it's going to take too much time to read all of it but I'm going to refer to significant parts of it. And I trust that you've read it. Have, have people read it? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Excellent. So three, I think, just big ideas I want to leave with you, and then we'll be done. The first thing that I see here in all of these different instructions that Paul gives to husbands and wives, to children and parents, and to masters and slaves, is that we are to love each other in those relationships like Jesus we're to follow his example. And we see Paul bring this out most powerfully in his teaching to husbands and wives. The reason being that that relationship out of all of the others is most reflective theologically of the gospel, of God's relationship with us. So he begins in verse 25, and we see this so clearly, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's kind of what he's already said in chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Here it is again. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Almost exactly. What's his point? If in all our relationships, husbands and wives, children and parents, employee, employer, if we can love each other like Jesus loved us, it will change everything. It will change everything. In John 13, Jesus said that that is the central hallmark of our Christian identity, to love like he loved us. Now, I don't know if you've ever sat for a moment. I've done this. It's scary to actually think about what that might look like, to love others, to love your husband, to love your wife like Jesus loves you. And that's why Paul says to husband, and see what's radical? And we miss this stuff, right? Because we just, we read about submission and we've just stopped reading. But notice how little time Paul spends talking to wives. Because he's not telling them anything that they don't know. And notice how much time Paul spends talking to husbands. Just word count alone tells you where Paul is focusing his energy. It's to teach something that was radical. That these husbands were to love their wives like Jesus loved the church. And he spells it out. Jesus sacrificed for the church. Jesus sanctifies the church. Jesus nourishes and nurtures the church. They're all the things that we're supposed to do, husbands, for our wives. Profound. Life-changing. Really, 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 really hard to do. To love like Jesus. See, and you might be sitting there going, well, you know, I don't have a good example of how to love my husband, how to love my wife, how to treat my kids, because I've had bad role models all my life. I've come from a broken home. I don't even know my father, or I don't, I don't know my mother, or I've lost my family very, very young. I've grown up as an orphan, whatever it might be. But the good news is that you, in Christ, have a great role model, the ultimate one, the best one. And the more you reflect on him, and receive love from him, it enables you to love others. Which is why you notice that Paul in chapter 5, when he begins, he says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. You need to start by knowing that you're loved, that Jesus loves you in a way that maybe you've never been loved. It's not till you get that revelation of how Jesus loves you that you have any hope of loving anyone. And then he goes on to say, and walk in the way of love. See, we try and walk in the way of love before knowing that we are dearly loved. Yeah. We are dearly loved. Second thing, Jesus is our motivation for loving. And Paul brings this out 
powerfully in the, in the section on, on slaves and masters. And what I mean by this is that, you know, I've often heard, you know, couples and, and kids and whatever say, if they do this, then I will. I've heard wives say, well, when my husband, you know, treats me with respect, then I will submit to him. When he earns it, then I will give him what I'm supposed to give. Or husbands say, when my wife stops nagging me, then I will love her like Jesus. But I don't see that. I'm sorry, uh, that's not there. This is unconditional. The only condition is out of reverence for Christ. 521, right? we're back. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's your motivation. That's your reason. The only reason. And listen to how Paul brings this out with slaves and, and their masters. Slaves, verse 5, chapter 6. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart. Why? Just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. It's Jesus. That's your motivation. That's your only motivation. To love your husband, your wife, your child, your parents, your boss, your, your employees is because of your commitment to Jesus. Because of your love for Him. Because you've received, point one, His love for you. And you're so secure in, in His love for you and you are so overwhelmed by wanting to live your life to honor Him that you love others out of that motivation unconditionally whether they're deserving of it or not, whether they're worthy of it or not, whether they have earned it or not. Or none of that matters. You do it as unto the Lord. You see, so often when we come to this passage, we focus on what Paul says to other people. Husbands always focus on what Paul says to wives. Wives always focus on what Paul... It's like, can we just hear Paul talking to us and not worry about anybody else? It's like... You know, when John 21, when Peter and Jesus are having that conversation, you know, feed my sheep, love me. And then Jesus and Peter are walking alongside and Peter goes, well, what about him? About John. And what does Jesus say? Don't worry about him. You follow me. And so often we, we, we forget that. We go, well, what about them, Jesus? What about my wife? And often that's how this is abused in churches with men telling women that they need to submit. But Paul is the one who tells them to do that. Let them hear it from Paul. See, submission is not something that can be demanded. It's something that can be, has to be given. And love, again, is not something that can be demanded. It's something that has to be given. Which is why Paul talks to the different people and tells them how they are to honor Christ in their relationship. I remember this came out powerfully to me you know, a few years ago. Uh, I speak re quite regularly at a, at a Tamil church, Sri Lankan church. And they asked me to come and do a seminar for their kids. And the brief I got, a bit like today, is come and tell our kids how they need to obey parents. Because <laughs> you're a Sri Lankan, they'll listen to you, you know, you've been, you just need to come and fix our kids. And so I said, yeah, I'm happy to do that, but you need to be there too. And so I preach from this passage. And I go, kids, this is what I'm going to tell you. And then I said, now parents, let me tell you what Paul is telling fathers and mothers of his time. Don't exasperate your children. It's not just one-sided. We always want God to get the other person. And we forget that God is more interested in getting us. Go, just get your heart right. You follow Jesus. You honor Jesus. You do what God is asking you to do to follow in Jesus' footsteps. That's your motivation. Point three. Jesus transforms our attitudes and our behavior. Attitudes and behavior. And like I said, again, Paul sets this up in chapter five, right at the beginning. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love, just as here's the attitude, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. It's, he's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus laying down his life on the cross. Jesus doesn't just stand at a distance and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. He does that, but he says, now I'm going to show you, demonstrate. In, in Romans 5, Paul says that God demonstrates his love in this, that while we were sinners, Christ dies for us. And throughout this passage, we see that Paul is dealing with their attitudes of submission and respect and honor and you know, all of those attitude stuff. But all of that has a physical expression. 
a behavioral expression, continuing on what he's been doing since chapter 4. How to be transformed in our attitudes and our words and our actions to reflect Christ in our relationships. He's doing the same thing here. But here's where it gets interesting. And these are the controversial bits that I'm going to say this morning. If you have any issues with it, talk to Rick. It's her fault. <laughs> I, I am convinced that even though Paul says in 521 that we are to submit to one another, yield to one another in love, the way he talks about each of the different groups, he's saying to them that that looks different. See, Paul never asks a husband to submit to his wife. And Paul doesn't seem to really say to the wives, love your husbands. I wonder why that is. Paul never tells children that they are to obey their parents, uh, that they are to, um, or parents, that they are to obey their children. Never. See, often I hear, when people talk about husbands and wives, they want to argue for the mutuality of love and respect. And I get that. But when you take that same matrix or that paradigm and try and apply it to the other things that Paul says in the household code, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Paul gives very instructions to masters as to how they are to treat their slaves. And that's the only time Paul gets close to kind of saying the same thing. Because in verse 9 he says this, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. That's, that's, that's the closest we get to this mutuality. Submission looks different depending on where you sit in these conversations. But notice what Paul also says to the masters. Do not threaten them. Now, a slave, he doesn't give that instruction to slaves because they had no power. So submission looks different depending on where you stand in the relationship. So husbands are told to love their wives sacrificially, to lay down their lives for their wives, which looks a lot like yielding in love. But he uses a different expression. For a wife, that looks like showing honor and respect to her husband. Children, they submit by obeying and honoring and showing respect. Parents show submission by nurturing their children, teaching them and instructing them and advising them and, and, and leading them in God's way. And certainly not provoking them and causing them angst and frustration. Slaves are told to, to respect their, their masters and, and work wholeheartedly to do their, their best work, whether they're being seen or not. Because Jesus is always watching. And masters are told, be careful, don't beat up your slaves, because you have a master too. Different instructions. So that's where I want to leave you. Now you have to figure out what submission looks like in your home. Keeping in mind that our culture is very different. Now we live in a world where kids can divorce their parents. That's unheard of. It, when Paul wrote this expression to fathers, you know why it was so radical? Because fathers had total authority over their kids. They could sell them. They could abandon them. They could even kill them legally. So when we try and take those instructions and apply it to today, you see the problem we encounter. And Paul is writing to a bunch of employers, masters, that could beat up their slaves, do whatever they wanted with them. We, don't, we live in an you know, industrial era of you know, fair work and all, you know, all kinds. It's just different. So how do we take the principles that Paul is talking about and live them out in our day? And every marriage here would probably be different. How do you live that out? What does submission and love and respect look like in your home? What does it mean for a husband to yield in love to his wife? What does it mean for a wife to yield in love to her husband? And given everything Paul said in chapter 4, surely it must at least affect your words, your attitude, your actions, your intentions, your motivations, everything. Same goes for parents and children. How do you live for Christ in that moment? This one question that I want to put up that maybe will help you think through this in your home and have conversations in your home and with others, maybe in your connect groups or Bible studies, however you do that. What does embracing the loving servant heart of Jesus look like in your home, in your workplace, in your community, 
What does it look like for you to wrap a towel around your waist, get down on your knees, even if you are the most powerful person in the room, as Jesus was in John 13, and wash the feet of somebody else? What does that look like in your workplace? What does that look like as a boss? What does that look like as a manager that has oversight and supervision and authority and power over people? What does that look like as an employee who has no voice, who's a checkout operator that nobody even knows the name of? What does it look like to work wholeheartedly for Jesus, whether anybody's looking at you or not, because you want to honor Him? What does it look like? It takes us back to the beginning of what Paul said. It, it looks like a crucified Savior. That's what it looks like. It looks like taking up your cross, denying yourself, laying your life down, not because the other person has deserved it, but because Jesus does. You see, and when I said the definition of submission is yielding out of love, I want to nuance that a little bit. Because there'll be people, I'm sorry, I've gone a bit over, in your life, in your workplace, that will drive you nuts. And you will not feel loving at all. Maybe it's your husband, maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents. <laughs> so how about when you think of this definition of submission and you think of yielding out of love, that it's not love for the person, but love for Jesus that makes you yield to them. Yeah. That's living the gospel out in a transformed way, radically. What does it look like to have radically different relationships in our culture? In our marriage relationships, in our parent child relationships, in our workplace relationships. And this morning, I want to finish by just inviting you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, to look to the cross. Because it has to begin there. It's the gospel. Follow the way of love. Well, what is the way of love? Paul says it is of God, Jesus, loving us and giving himself for us. And Jesus does all of that, Romans 5, while we were his enemies. Because we've sinned and rebelled and rejected God and we've turned our back on Him. We were running the other way and Jesus is there with arms outstretched inviting us into intimacy and relationship with Him. And He's willing not just to say I love you but to demonstrate the power of His love to embrace in His body and in His spirit the full impact of your sin and my sin. Not just in the physical suffering and torment but being rejected by the Father being the recipient of God's wrath and anger so that you and I would never have to. So that Paul can say there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God in Jesus, because he has absorbed the, full, the fullness of God's wrath, as we heard Tim share about this morning. It starts there. And if you've not begun this journey, I invite you, talk to one of the leaders here, open your heart to Jesus, receive his love, because that is the only way you can love anyone by receiving the fullness of Jesus' love for you. Will you take a moment to bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just want to invite you, whether you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for a hundred years, you've just become a Christian, you're not yet a Christian, to just take a moment to sit with that truth of God's love for you in Jesus. Because Paul says, follow the way of love. Follow Jesus and just remind yourself of how loved you are. Father, we just pause in this moment to sit in your presence, to sit with Jesus. Lord, whatever our story is and whatever our journey has been to this moment, Lord, this is a divine appointment. And I pray that each person here will have a Jesus and Peter moment, that we would not be distracted by those around us, by the brokenness of our relationships. And Lord, maybe there are broken, painful, deeply wounded relationships represented in this room. I pray that they will hear Jesus' invitation to follow and receive the incredible love that will bring healing and restoration to those places of hurt, to those places of rejection, to those places of abandonment, to those places of deep betrayal and wounding and abuse. Father, it's in your love.
And so we invite you by your Holy Spirit to come that we might receive again your love afresh today. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus. I know I've gone over and I'm going to hand back to Ken but I'd love to pray for people um, who've experienced some of those things pain, hurt, rejection, abandonment we want to pray for you to receive the love of Jesus and so as we continue with the service I invite you to come and so we can pray and minister to you that you might know how loved you are today in Jesus Oh